Part 2, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, The Philosopher. So Rebecca, we thought in this section we'd ask you some more questions rather about you know, why philosophy won't go away and perhaps what getting rid of the, uh, the naysayers of philosophy and um, kind of the bread that you're baking now you've moved away from just mathematics and physics, um, and, and your philosophical positions. We mentioned in the introduction of the episode that in 2011, uh, you were named humanist of the year by the American Humanist Association. So no surprises then that, um, you don't believe in God, but would you consider <laughs> yourself, um, an atheist still? And how would you describe your other philosophical positions? Would you you say you're a naturalist, a secularist, a physicalist? What labels would you associate with yourself? Mm, um, a secular humanist, I think. Okay. Uh, is um, what a label I'm comfortable with. An uh, atheist as well? So you say God does not exist? I'll put it this way. I'd be damn surprised to discover that this is a universe <laughs> in which anything like the Abrahamic God uh, is in control. Uh, yes, uh, it, I, I would say not only don't the arguments work, right? Um, but this empirically just does not seem to be the kind of universe, uh, that is consistent, uh, with the kind of God described by the Abrahamic religions. I think there is, there is, uh, Secular grounding for morality. I find, uh, the uh, attempt to insert God into, uh, into the discussion of, you know, what the difference is between right and wrong, um, completely unconvincing. Um, and I, uh, and I also find the kinds of motivations, uh, to be good that it appeals to immoral, right? Mm. Um, not to be good because it is good. It is the right thing to do. Uh, but uh, because you're going to be rewarded by God. I mean, this is all old hat stuff, but I, it's something I believe very strongly. That's very, very clear. And actually, that leads really well on to a nice question. So you mentioned the secular uh, kind of understanding of morality. And we know that the meaning of life is a topic which concerns you greatly. Um, without a God, then, can the atheist find a meaning to life that's ultimate or is it temporary? Yes, well, um, very uncomfortable with that word, the meaning of life. I've never been able to get my mind around it. <laughs> mm. um, you know, I understand what the meaning of sentences is or the meaning of a theory and I don't understand. You know, it, it seemed, seems to me that there's a background assumption when people are asking what's the meaning of life, which is that the cosmos somehow has something in mind for us, you know, and we're supposed to figure out what it is the cosmos has in mind for us. Um, and, and, and that would be the meaning of life. And if there is no such thing that the cosmos has in mind for us, then life has no meaning. Um, well, in that sense, I think life has no meaning because I don't think the cosmos has anything in mind for us. I don't think the <laughs> cosmos has any attitude toward us whatsoever. But uh, a multitude of meaningful ways to, to, to live one's, one's life. I think that the, you know, one of the things about, well, I've told you, I, I, I like this term matter very much, you know, yeah. mattering. Um, and uh, I, I'd rather speak in terms of mattering than in terms of meaning, mm. because meaning, as I say, seems to have this background assumption that I don't buy into. But I think, uh, you know, we all, we all want to matter. Um, we, uh, we, we want to feel as if our lives matter. It's just a part of good mental health. And, and in fact, in, in the U.S., there's a suicide, uh, a, a U.S. government suicide hotline. And it's called You Matter because it's just such a fundamental aspect of, of being a healthy, flourishing human being. Uh, to mm. feel as if you're, you, you matter. But there are various ways that we can go about trying to establish our mattering. Um, I do it through my, you know, writing, but I think more importantly to me, through my personal relationships, <laughs> actually. Mm. Uh, we all have different ways of doing it. Um, that give us the sense, you know, that we're, we're, we matter, that our lives are not for nothing. We might as well not have been at all. That's a horrible, that's a horrible uh, way of feeling. Um, and so that seems to me a more, I don't know, 
meaningful question to me. Mm-hmm. What are the ways uh, that are that we can pursue our mattering that that um, are healthy and which are not, and uh, which are immoral? Some of them are immoral. If I decide that the only way I can matter is to go invade. Poland, <laughs> um, well then, too, too glad for me, you know, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. lock me up and, uh, and don't allow me to pursue my needs of mattering. So there are these questions. Uh, this is the way that I, I try to make sense out of these questions mm-hmm. of meaning, translating them into mattering. Let us pause for a moment and hear a quick message from our sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. My name is Jess. I'm a third year student here at NCH, which means I only have nine months left, which is really sad. I study philosophy with English, and I'm also the president of the student union. There are many ways you can get involved with the union. One is you can come to our meetings. We're always welcome to having guests. We actually really love it. You could join the events committee, which works alongside the events officer to plan everything that happens in NCH. Elections happen at the end of the first term, so you'll have had an entire term to settle in, to figure out where your place is in NCH, and then you can run for a position on the union yourself. Like many students, my first year at university was a bit of a challenge. I experienced some mental health difficulties. I started um, experiencing anxiety and had the occasional panic attack. And being at NCH, I received the most incredible support I could have ever wanted. My friends and my fellow students who I wasn't even that close to were always there for me. And the systems that we have in college are fantastic. You can apply to New College of the Humanities directly or through UCAS and be considered for a scholarship worth up to £2,000 per year. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk. Think better. Think NCH. You can find the link to the New College of the Humanities on our website as well as in the iTunes description. OK, let's head back over to the discussion. Is it? Can we press this point, though? I mean, so if we look at the science and what the science tells us about the universe that we exist in, you know, we know that the universe is expanding. We we know that there will be a time where there won't be any, probably any human life left within the universe. Um, you know, the the stars will die. All the laws will fail. Um, with this kind of destructive apocalypse, you know, billions of years in the future, does do we still really matter? I mean, do our universe? human actions have any purpose? I mean, you mentioned that the universe, according to the laws of the universe, we don't matter. Um, yeah. And with that, with that kind of, you know, uh, I guess lack of hope, I guess you could put it in in the in the future. Um, you know, how can we still find meaning, even though we're, you know, somewhat uh, have our fleeting existence within a universe that will eventually die? Um, that, that's nice and cheery. It's supposed to be laughing as well as doing philosophy. I, 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 there's one there's Woody Allen scene. I can't remember which movie it's from, um, where his um, he he discovers that the universe, you know, that the Earth is going to, you know, burn out, or the sun's going to burn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the sun's going to burn out in a thousand years, and um, and uh, his mother takes him to the psych to a psychiatrist but his right. mother is saying you know he's saying this is going to happen in the universe and she, and, and the, the mother's saying what does it have to do with you you're not in the universe you're in brooklyn right this <laughs> 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 not running out in brooklyn i think there's a lot of a, a lot of uh, wisdom in that i mean all of this is all of this is true but here's where uh, i'm very i'm very um influenced by spinoza and what i'm mm. about to say um, Spinoza, he makes the basis of, of, of the, of his ethics, um, he packs it into this term, conitas, right? right? Our, our drive to survive and to flourish, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that, that, uh, that we all have, right? I mean, and, and now we have evolutionary biology to explain to us why we have this. I mean, sort of we're being programmed by our genes, right? They just are using us to replicate themselves on into the next uh, generation. But who cares what it is? I mean, in order for, I, this is our, we're driven by this. This is what it is to be a human. Um, we want to uh, survive and we want to flourish. And in us, given because we're self-conscious creatures, right? 
we we look at ourselves, you know, scurrying like ants up an anthill, and we ask, you know, for what? Why are we mm. doing this? And mm. we want to come up with some sort of reason. We matter to ourselves, but we want to just matter, right? Mm -hmm. Just just matter, plain and simple. And we think in terms of mattering to the universe, and of course, that's the great source of our belief in God, right? Uh, God would truly stamp us with mattering. He intentionally created us, me personally, right? Um, what more um, justification could I have that I'm that I'm that I matter made in God's image? Um, but just because that doesn't work. <laughs> Does it mean that we are, are not going to pursuing our life with all the energy and attention mm. that we simply have to? Uh, just, mm -hmm. it, it's just sort of built in to being human. It's, it's the condition of leading a recognizably human life. Yeah. Um, and we can't, we do, needn't justify that. Look, we can't justify logic either, right? We can't justify Induction, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's built into what it is to be a reasonable person, mm -hmm. uh, to live a recognizable human life. Pursuing a life in which we try to demonstrate that we matter is built into the conditions of being a, hu a human. Mm -hmm. And certain things follow from that. For example, something that follows from that is you look at that in yourself and you realize everybody else is doing exactly the same thing, that we're all kind of in on this together. Um, that's a kind of moral implication that follows from just seeing these conditions operating in oneself. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of the way Hume is the one. He, he creates such problems for us, you know. He shows us we can't justify um, deductive logic. We can't justify yeah. inductive logic. There is a gap between is and ought. And I mm. think the way always to answer you is to say, yeah, you're right, but here's what it is to be a human. Um, we, we can't stop doing this. And now we know why we have a psychological evolutionary explanations for it. We're not going to stop. Reason isn't going to stop us. You know, seeing that we have no reason isn't going to stop us. Hume tells us this, right? Uh, so given this is where we are, let's try to be as consistent as possible. Um, and I think that that's how we, I think that that's that's a kind of answer. Um, yeah, no, it, it it's just to tie in. Um, I think your answer is good there. It's it's considering you know where where we why we matter. But there's this extra element which is you've mentioned before that morals as well. And on page seven of your book, um, you kind of mention what I like to call that like this kind of morals for mortals. I'm going to quote straight from your book here on page seven. And what is remarkable about the Greeks, even pre philosophically, is that despite the salience of religious rituals in their lives, when it came to the question of what it is that makes an individual human life worth living, they didn't look to their immortals, but rather approach the question immortal terms. Now, earlier this year, um, I saw you took a part in a debate with Jordan Peterson and William Lane Craig in Toronto, and Craig oh, yeah, really that pushed was you. Fun, man. <laughs> 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 I've been told it's not going to be a debate. You're just going to present your ideas. <laughs> well, it certainly was. It came to a debate. I, uh, Craig really pushed you on this notion of, uh, I guess, significance in moral action. Uh -huh. um, so, so, just to kind of uh, summarize his argument, he was saying that your moral actions have no significance without a God. With a God, your actions matter. Without one, they don't. Because if you act well, you, it, there's something in it for you. It's got, I guess, ultimate mattering. Um, it's got, it, the, they mean in the grand scheme of things quite a lot because you'll have this eternity um, afterwards, either of suffering or, or happiness in heaven. Um, is there any point of being moral without a God, I guess, as Craig's, uh, criticism of your position is, there. I, I just I would, it's one which a lot of um theologians like to uh, philosophers of religion i i, I just find it at a moral level um hmm, egregious almost what i should only be moral because there's something in it for me i'm going mm. to get you know, a pat on the head or eternal, you know, lollipops or whatever the <laughs> that you, 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 you know, Kant told us it's not enough to be moral. The action hmm. itself is not moral. The reason that you do it um, 
is 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 what makes it moral. You do it Good. because it's moral, right? You hmm. see that it is moral, um, and even if it goes wrong, you know, it has it doesn't go as you meant, and it actually, you know, as so many of my good deeds have <laughs> have not gone well. Um, hmm. Kant would say that's okay, Rebecca, you know, because you. You, you try to do it for the right reasons. You try to think mm. about and do it for the right reasons. To be rewarded by the guy up above who you can't even say is a moral god, um, because, because what, what, what Craig is saying is morality consists in God's approval. You know, right. it consists, that's what it consists in. So you can't even say that God himself you, you, there's nothing independent of God's approval by which we could even say that God is good. This is an old argument. It goes back to Plato's Euthyphro, right? Mm. Um, so I, I, I just, I'm just flabbergasted by, by that, by that argument. It means that if I can get away with things, mm. uh, you know, immoral, uh, you know, like the ring of Gyges you're, and, and you're and, only good for like these behaviorist reasons, but for, for being treated or being punished and it's pointless if you don't have them. I think your response is, is a very good one. I think even Craig at the time kind of accepted it. So if you're being good just to get into heaven, I guess God knows that you're doing it. So you're not going to get into heaven. The yeah, only, if I'm God, I'm being, not. Yeah. No way. You're be, not getting in. No. <laughs> being good is an end in itself. It's for the sake of itself, not for something extra. If I say I'll treat you if you're good. Why but would, I mean, he, right now there are, there's tremendous suffering going on in the world. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, <laughs> There are, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to bring this up, but I am just so obsessed with what is going on in the U.S. right now. You know, that there are, there are children who are being separated from their mothers and their fathers. They are being, uh, put in cages. They are, uh, there are children. These are children. I know that this is wrong. I, I, I don't need, uh, you know, uh, any statement from above for me to know that this is wrong. I know that the most uh, innocent and the most defenseless of creatures um, ought to be protected and, and, and not, not punished and not be used as ends as a means for political ends. If I know that anything right. is wrong, I know that this is wrong. And, I, now, Craig, I, I just Craig don't will, even know what to say to this, this argument, uh, really. Uh, it's just that it stinks. It's a horrible ju argument. <laughs> just just to keep it stinking for a moment longer. Because <laughs> um, the most interesting question for the... I think you, you get off the hook so far, and I think that's absolutely right. That's the right response from the atheist. You do these good things for the sake of them being good, and I can see out in the world bad things, and I ought to stop them. But the theist is going to say, and Craig says to you as well, he, he likes this line quite a lot. You see it a lot in his debates. He says, you know, for the atheists I'm debating, uh, things like murder and rape, they're just unfashionable, evolutionary oh, speaking. <laughs> um, they're just unfashionable byproducts of evolution. So he'll say to you, how do you get objective moral values? You can't without a God. So when you say it's bad for children to be taken away from the mothers, what you really mean, you evolutionary naturalist is that it's just unfashionable you say boo boo to um, children being separated from them you're not actually saying there's a fact about the world that it's wrong how, how can i know this, this is a can of worms you could literally have a, a whole podcast dedicated to this and beyond but yeah. um can you explain objective moral values on the atheist's account i do ground things um as i, I say you know sort of uh, from a spinozist point of view. Um, or or Ber uh, Bernard Williams, another uh, fantastic uh, yeah. British philosopher. He, he Brits produce some mighty fine philosophers. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, he said that uh, practical reason is always first personal. Uh, you begin with yourself, right? We have, as I said, we have this great drive uh, to survive and to flourish. And if somebody went to matter, and if somebody treats me in a way that stymies this for no good reason, right? Mm. Um, I am just, I'm going to feel outrage, indignation, right? Uh, especially if there's absolutely no reason whatsoever, right? They just haul off and punch me or something, you know? Um, mm. and, uh, and, and it, it's not possible to be a human and not feel, why, why did you why did you do that? Account for yourself. Didn't, hmm. Don't you know the pain that you're causing me? 
Um, now, if you if you wouldn't feel that if I if I had just stood up in and um, on that stage in Toronto and um, slammed Craig and you know uh, I did once punch a, 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 a literary <laughs> critic in the stomach actually so I'm not beyond these things right <laughs> I'm never doing full to but if I had done that he would have been outraged and he would say how could you do that you maniac uh, you hysterical woman. Um, you know, and, and I would say, oh, I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm just, I am just demonstrating. You see what you're saying to me? Account for yourself. How could you do that? Don't I realize that I had reason not to act that way? You're mm -hmm. already on moral grounds when you make this argument for yourself and for your own, the ones whose rights you always stand up for. It's built in to being a human being, that we account, we, you know, we ask people to account for their behavior towards us. We, it's built into our moral emotions of, of indignation and, and outrage. Um, mm. and, uh, um, and then you, you, you look at that and you say, okay, well, there are two possibilities here. Either I'm cosmically special. Everybody has, everybody has a reason to treat me well. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm kind of special. Well, the word for that is, you know, uh, malignant narcissism or something like that, you know, something, some form of mental illness. Uh, but, you know, if you're not mentally ill, you're going to realize, well, maybe the reasons that I had, you know, that, that people have for treating me with a certain amount of decency and respect apply to others as well. So we're just doing hand gestures I love there. It. You can yeah, I feel like <laughs> I'm some... at a baseball game, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's the very occasional time when you pause, and then we're do just doing hand yeah, gestures. Just... <laughs> <and we're... laughs> so uh, um, yeah, this is where. So this is where you know. I think it starts as Bernard Williams said: "Practical reason is essentially first personal, and then you build from there." Hmm. Um, just a final question on this section before we move on to a couple of listener questions as we wrap up. Um, just, I know I said we'll let it stink for one last, but, um, <laughs> I, I, I never said I was a man of my word. Starting to read. Um, I don't have an objective moral <laughs> value to, um, to adhere to. It's just unfashionable not to keep promise keeping. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Craig, Craig said to you, he gave you a quote from Steven Pinker, which was quite unusual. Talk which, about uh, stinking. Boy, was that yeah. a dirty trick. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. I, at least um, I, I can stop being impartial for a second. I think the audience realized as well. But he kind of says something like, um, you know, Stephen Pink and yourself, I believe you subscribe to this idea and listeners will remember our in interview with Stephen, that we're making real moral progress. And you say, you told us that earlier on in this interview. Um, and is it, if we don't have an objective moral value, because you're saying it's built into us, which might play into Craig's hands a little bit there, because that's kind of as he's saying it's built into it. And therefore, it's just, you know, you can't, is that is ought um, divide, which we mentioned earlier from Hume. There's some problems here with saying, it, oh, it's evolutionary. So, and therefore, um, it's not surprising that we, that we do this and say, account for yourself. Um, I guess my question is Craig's question, which is if there's no objective moral values, then we're just making moral changes or political changes. You know, women getting the vote is a change and um, treating animals differently is a change. Um, not having slavery is a change. Whether you and Stephen and the majority of secular humanists want to say that no, and atheists, they want to say, no, it's not just change. It's progress. How can you make how can you make your case that it's not just moral change, it's moral progress? Yeah. So first of all, of course, not everything that can be explained in terms of our attitudes and our reactions um, by evolutionary psychology um, are accepted, right, That as, as moral, right? I mean, mm. uh, xenophobia, for example. There's a terrific evolutionary explanation for why we have such a tendency uh, towards xenophobia to, you know, and I, I actually spent some time, some time in, um, uh, observing, uh, chimpanzees with, um, uh, a, a wonderful, ev uh, uh, evolutionary anthropologist, Richard Rangham. Um, and, uh, in, we were in Uganda, uh, Steve was at, with me as well, in Uganda and in Tanzania. Um, and, you know, they're very xenophobic. You know, if, if a, mm -hmm. if a chimp from a, a, another, uh, tribe, you know, ventures over and the numbers are in the favor of the invaded tribe, they will tear this chimp limb from limb. They can recognize, you know, which chimp doesn't belong. And, and there are very good evolutionary, ex, you know, explanations for all of this. And, and we are, you know, we are chimps, right? <laughs> and, uh, and we, we, we have, 
inherited a lot of the behavior of chimpanzees, including their incredible uh, mistreatment of females, right? <laughs> that female mm -hmm. chimps do not matter as much as as, as male male chimps. Um, and we, you know, we have been, we've inherited these these things. And so, you know, evolutionary explanations, you know, are not going to take the place of moral philosophy, right? Because you mm -hmm. know, to just say, yeah, this is how we're primed to act. It doesn't, doesn't mean that that's the way we ought to act. I mean, in fact, you could say that with civilization and education and philosophy and, you know, moral philosophy in particular is what it is, is a, is a, is a struggle against our inner chimp, right? Chimps right. are not lovely creatures. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, just giving evolutionary explanations, that, that doesn't, there's a big difference between, uh, justifying morally, you know, philosophically and explaining, uh, why we have various tendencies toward, toward rape, mm -hmm. toward xenophobia, towards all sorts of lovely things, uh, towards lying, towards seeing our own group as the master race, all of these lovely, uh, things that, you know, but then we ask for accountability and especially the others, um, who may not belong to your, uh, master race might, get into the act and ask for accountability. Come on, convince us, convince us. We're humans, we're fellow humans, convince us mm. of this. And that's, so, you know, we, evolutionary and psychology, evolutionary biology, this is never the last word in anything. But what I would say is like, there are, there are certain deep down aspects of being a human um, that are un, changeable they're they're there's they're somehow they're essential to us uh, that we mm -hmm. pursue our lives we don't just behave but we pursue our lives with great attention with great energy that we want it to be a good life a worthwhile life we don't want it to be a you know a wasted life this is this goes all the way back it's the it, it's, it's the uh, genesis of religion of philosophy of science of of art um of History of everything and of, and of, and of just our community building, right? Our politics, all of these things. Um, this is the whole great panoply of human behavior comes out from this attempt to not live a wasted life, to, um, to matter in, in some way. Yes. And mm. we're not going to give that up. So to say that, and yes, I can give an evolutionary explanation for it. Um, but seeing the evolutionary, here, here's, here's, maybe this will be, be a good way of answering. Seeing the evolutionary explanation for xenophobia, for sexism, for all of these things, once right. I see it, I see it's unjustified, right? I, right. See, I'm, I can give it up. I ought to give it up, right? We all ought to give it up. Seeing the way the genes operate in us that make us live our lives with our full attention and energy and want to make something of those lives um, doesn't make me give up on, on that. Um, I can explain it, but I will still pursue my life with all the passion uh, that I can bring to bear with it because it's my life, right? It's mm -hmm. my life. Um, and so that's, Maybe that's the way I would want to distinguish. You know, there are certain things. It's just like Hume's argument, um, not being able to justify inductive, uh, reasoning. You know, I mm -hmm. see his argument. Will that make me, will it make Hume give up on inductive reasoning? No, of course not. You know, because we simply can't. Um, that's a sort of condition of being a reasonable person. So, hmm, I sort of argued my way into this. I'm like, and I kind of like it. Do you, do you like it? Yeah, I, yeah it's you know. good. It's good philosophy. You can see yourself debating with yourself. You told me earlier that you needed um, more than one person to do philosophy, but you seem to, uh, you can manage it alone. <laughs> well, you say you're, was, you're giving me, and, and even Craig, uh, you know, he's, he's in on this, right? I mean, you know, mm. I mean, he, he has this criticism and I didn't, I didn't really have it all together, um, because I didn't, I think I was going to a debate uh, when I spoke to him, but you know, but it was useful. Well, he certainly did because he had quotes, <laughs> he had quotes yes, really yes, from yes, all these yes, angles. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, but can I just say something? So, you know, when he threw that thing up at me, um, he said, oh, Rebecca, I, uh, first he just wanted to ignore me altogether, right? Because I'm, I was just this woman right <laughs> there. But um, then, um, but you know, uh, 
kept elbowing my way in. So then finally he, he turns to me and he goes that he has this quote and he wants me to identify it. And he reads me this mm. quote and I'm trying to think, who can it be? And then he triumphantly says, he identifies, student figure, right? Mm. Now, I, I didn't know where I came from, right? I mean, mm. I, I had no idea. And so when I got back to the hotel room, I looked it up and here's what it came from. It came from this um, article that Steve mm. had written in the New York Times magazine about morality. And he, it was the sort of, it was a conditional statement. Right. If, you know, if we can find a grounding for morality outside of God, then yeah. our, like, you know, there, then there can, some, I don't know, it was something, it was, a, it was an if then proposition. Yeah, if we can't find then, the object. Okay. And yeah. he didn't, did he use the if in the quotation he yeah. gave you? Um, Perhaps he did, and I wasn't paying close enough attention. I don't know. But the whole rest of the argument went mm. on and to say that the antecedent of that conditional was not satisfied. That was the whole, ah, that's how right. we introduced the whole thing. So that's it, bad philosophy, I'm afraid to say, <laughs> Bill, if very, you're listening. <laughs> very good debating skills. And as, as Socrates, you know, had long ago taught us, there's a great difference between good philosophy and sophistical debating styles. So, Rebecca, we've got some listener questions for you. If you can answer them as quickly as you can so we can go through as many. Should we yes. try and limit you to 30-second responses? Yes. Should we yes. play that as a game? Yes. Um, do you want us to hit the first one, Ollie? Sure. So this question is from Guilla Bonino from Italy, and they ask, do you agree with Plato's view of democracy? If not, why not? Yes, he had a very bad view of, of democracy, of Athenian democracy. Um, and uh, he 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 didn't have much faith in the masses at all. When I when I wrote Plato at the Googleplex, one of my mm. things I wanted to do was bring Plato back, you know, in those dialogues and say, "Look, Plato, look how well we're doing." Um, not not so sure now. <laughs> not so sure now. <laughs> one of the things that Plato did say was that um, you know he warned us against uh, um, you know demagoguery, uh, the power of persuasion mm. of rhetoric. Um, and of money, of money in politics, and right. uh, and and both of those things are are high supply uh, in American politics right now. So you'd say you agree with his criticisms of democracy. Um, well, there's some value in l learning about his criticisms of democracy. It's still relevant some, I, today. I, yes, I do. I do think that that is true. Yes. Um, our next question comes from Sabina Pilchova from the Czech Republic, who asks, what are some of the most interesting philosophical questions relating to artificial intelligence? Hmm. Um, I guess to me, uh, you know, uh, it will be at what point do we have to regard uh, artificial intelligent, um, intelligence as having um, certain moral rights? Uh, ah, if right. are, um, that to me is uh, it's a very interesting question. Suffering is that the answer? Do you find follow Peter Singer and people like this in this? Suffering is very important, but I, you know, of course, to me, it's a if they were to to uh, evince their own conitas, right, their mm. own drive to pursue their if they mattered to themselves, right? Uh, okay, uh, that would be to me. Uh, uh, sign that we have to start thinking about ethics as, as it applies to them. Another one from Sabina Pilchova. With your interest in philosophy and writing, have you ever considered a career with more job security? <laughs> huh. um, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm very driven by my passions. <laughs> um, and so, uh, no. <laughs> So the next one from Ludwig Rao. My name is Rob Howell. Is she a moral realist? And, and if so, how does she deal with the is all get? Oh, yes. Years old. Well, I guess I spoke uh, a little bit about that. You know, that uh, I, I feel that there are certain NCH was conditions uh, that make the pursuing of our own life possible. Mm -hmm. because um, and, that, uh, the and that is 
um, that's are, an is are rigorous but sympathetic uh, that to already has the certain thoughts built into it. It is an institution right. with okay. um, um, a, a final question from a listener. I'm sorry we haven't got through all listener here, questions that we've really received heaps, but like I say, we've, uh, we really want to press to Rebecca on earlier points. And, and if you haven't really had your question asked, it's probably because this the one is the most insightful question we could possibly ask. Josh Brown asks, if you only have one eye, are you winking or are you blinking? And <laughs> endless fascination, uh, and it's definitely something have... that I will be taking with me after I leave NCH. <laughs> yeah. They stop me. Uh, uh, listener, uh, Rebecca's put her hand over her eye. It's, it's doing some empirical <laughs> research. I'm also, I'm also trying to figure out. Wait, so you, see, your eye is open. Like the one eye that you have is open, right? Mm. And so it's just staying open. So I think so. You're, then you're doing neither, right? Because you're not winking. It's full psychotomy. Yeah, you're not you're not winking and you're not winking. What what are you doing? You're you're looking out <laughs> with your one eye. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, who said you can dissect the philosophical question? Dissect it. Unfortunately, uh, you learn more about it, but the your question dies at the same time, Josh Brown. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> let us pause once again to hear from our fantastic sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. My name is Rob Howell. I'm a History with English student and I'm going into my final year at NCH. I'm 42 years old and I spent 20 years working in banking and asset management. NCH was a far more human institution than any other that I encountered because it's accessible. The academics here um, are, are rigorous but sympathetic to the struggles that people have. It is an institution with um, a human face and, and humanist principles. Coming here I was really apprehensive about my capacity to, to make the intellectual cut and I'm really glad that the tutors here saw something in me which I didn't believe I had, which has proven to be a source of inspiration and endless fascination and it's definitely something that I will be taking with me after I leave NCH. You can apply to New College of the Humanities directly or through UCAS and be considered for a scholarship worth up to £2,000 per year. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk. Think better. Think NCH. You can find the link to the New College of the Humanities on our website as well as in the iTunes description. OK, let's head back over to the discussion. Um, so just before we get into concluding remarks, Rebecca, do you fancy a quick game? We have a game with all of our guests. Okay. Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. Um, so we're playing Rebecca Golding Stein. So you can have quotes from a Rebecca, a quotes from a Golding, and quotes from a Stein, and maybe a couple of quotes from yourself as well. So you can have quotes from Rebecca, who's Rebecca Black, the American YouTuber and singer best known for her hit single Friday. <laughs> you can have quotes from Golding. because <laughs> Rebecca Black, singer. Yeah. Singer. Um, you've got uh, William Gerald Golding, who wrote Lord of the Flies. Mm. And you've got your Stein is Rick Stein, the celebrity chef in the UK, who describes himself as having a passion for seafood, restaurants, accommodation, shops and cookery <laughs> schools. <laughs> That's all good chefs should. And you've got quotes from yourself, Rebecca Goldstein, the philosopher and novelist. Huh. Um, so I'm going to give you them. Um, you tell me whether you think it's Rebecca Golding, Stein or Rebecca Goldstein. Holly hasn't seen them before, so there's no collusion. Uh, my moral compass is all in order. Um, first quotation. 7 a.m., waking up in the morning, got to be fresh, got to go downstairs. Got to have my bowl, got to have cereal. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Rebecca Black. I'm Ollie? also going to say Rebecca yes, Black. Yes, that's one all. That was Rebecca Black. Language fits over experience like a straight jacket. Oh, I'm going, it's, it's a quite literary, so I'm going to say Golding. What do you reckon, Ollie? Uh, I'm going to agree. Yeah, sounds very... You can't just literary. steal Rebecca's answers. That's oh, too all. The bully mind is not capable of loving or respecting other, nor can it love or respect itself. Mm. Well, because Lord of the Flies is about the bully mind, I'm going to say Golding, but it might be a trick. I'm going to go Stein. But as if you went for Stein. It makes it look like this collusion. It was Stein. Well, he yeah. hasn't just got a passion for restaurants. He's got a passion for uh, making philosophical statements as well, ah. apparently. Crikey. 
Um, <laughs> my yesterdays walk with me. They keep step. They are grey faces that peer over my shoulder. Well, it sounds like Henri Bergson. Um, let's see. Um, my, mm, it's also quite <sighs> literary, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to go Rebecca Black. I think that was a single no one heard. So I'm going to go with yeah. Uh, okay, I'm I'm going to I'm going with Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> you can't steal Ollie's answer, and you wrongly <laughs> cheated and stole his answer. It was uh, Golding that one. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, <laughs> I, when I was making these, I thought they might be too obvious. So I was worried that, <laughs> and you you think you're, you're questioning them too much. Sometimes the answer doesn't require deep philosophical thinking. Uh, Friday is about hanging out with friends and having fun. Friday is about. Hmm. That's got to be a red herring, surely. Yeah. Friday is about hanging out with friends and having fun. I'm going to go with Stein. Um, I'm going to go with Rebecca. It's Rebecca. Well done, Rebecca. Okay, we'll play final point wins because I've lost track of the <laughs> score as a good quiz host should. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the philosopher who knows how to write great novels. And it's it's one of those four. It's not one of those four. Well, then it's a trick question. Yes. Can you tell me who it's from? President Obama? It is President Obama to yourself. There you go. Sorry, that was a cheeky wow. one added in that. Yes. I, I have to say that those, those words uh, sort of got imprinted on. I was so overwhelmed by, by them. That, yes. Well, he, again, he's uh, he's not telling a lie there. Um, you are a philosopher and you do know how to write great novels. So that's certainly true. Um, I thought we'd do a round of concluding remarks just as we finish. Ollie, any final thoughts as, as we wrap up here? Sure. Yeah, this has been a great interview, Rebecca. It's been fantastic to talk to you. I think a very warm interview, I would say, was the word I would use. It's been fantastic just to sit and talk about, you know, as people who are very interested in philosophy, you know, just why it has value, why it makes progress and how it can, you know, hopefully change the world. Um, I think that philosophy is something that's universal i think you don't need a phd or a, or a degree to do philosophy you just need to have an inquisitive well you just need a mind really it doesn't even need to be that inquisitive and ask questions and i think uh, that's been a theme throughout the interview and it's been fantastic to hear your thoughts about a really broad range of topics from morality to god and um and, and your fabulous book so thank you very much rebecca it's been it's been really warm thank you um i love reading philosophy in that hopefully shouldn't come as a surprise to any listeners um but i can understand why most people uh quote unquote most people hesitate to engage with philosophical text um most won't find them enjoyable or accessible the you know the academic analytic philosophy but rebecca your work gives them really no excuse i think like plato your style of writing's accessible and captivating but most importantly speaking from my own experience it, it does make you laugh and smile and i think that's something we we try and uh, cultivate here on the pan Psychast as well and um, people in, will engage in philosophy if you present it in the right way i think bertrand russell's wrong and I think that um, I think that Plato's now freed prisoner is just a very bad at marketing. I think if you, uh, <laughs> if you present it in the right way, people will think and they will engage in philosophy. And um, yeah, I, I think hopefully the listener now, if you you've listened to this interview, ask yourself why are you listening? And if you're not teaching or researching or a student of philosophy, hopefully it's because you think um, it's enjoyable and you know it's because it's presented in the right way. And here's a perfect example. The numbers are in. Uh, Russell's wrong. People that people are engaging in philosophy if they present it rightly. Uh, Stephen Fry nicely sums up on the cover of your book. I'm quoting here. Uh, Newberger Goldstein manages to be so funny and so right. And he's got it spot on. And I admire the work that you're doing. And it's been an absolute pleasure reading your work. And on behalf of myself and our listeners, thank you for taking the time to to speak with us today, Rebecca. Well, can I can I thank both of you uh sincerely really it was great great fun and um i really yeah i think you're right i do think that uh plato got it wrong that 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 there's something you know in being a human uh that 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 makes us all interested in these philosophical questions and which is why i think for those of us who have had the great privilege of being able to devote our lives uh to philosophy we kind of owe it to uh to share the good stuff um, there's plenty of bad stuff, but you're, you're awakening is the good stuff. Uh, you're right. I think, and, 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 uh, broadcasts like this, podcasts like this are doing a tremendous service, uh, to, to, to people, to philosophers, and I think to civil society. 
Never mind philosophy, Rebecca's probably thinking why we won't go away, so let's wrap up the discussion here. A very special thank you to all of our patrons. If you enjoyed this episode and you're yet to show your support, please head over to our Patreon page and make a pledge. Your support will mean we can produce more frequent, higher quality content and free the prisoners from their chains and inspire free thinking. Everything we receive goes right back into producing the show, so please don't hesitate. Click the link in the iTunes description or visit our website to show your support. Any amount goes a long way. One dollar, two dollars. When it adds up, it it goes a very long way. And we've mentioned in our after show. Uh, patrons what we've been using the money for um, if you can't spare a dollar a month please consider telling a friend about the show let them know what they've been missing but Jack I'd rather <laughs> not do something so selfless <laughs> well Ollie, you're in luck share the show and get something yourself head over to our social media pages and share our competition post to be in with the chance of winning Rebecca Goldstein's Plato at the Googleplex why philosophy won't go away if you can spare a dollar and you're not enjoying the show consider doing something good for the sake of good itself <laughs> donate to an effective charity through the life you can save for more information please visit thepantsycats.com forward slash charity lastly this episode of the podcast is brought to you by New College of the Humanities. To find out more about New College of the Humanities, of which Rebecca Newberger Goldstein and some of our previous guests are visiting lecturers, you can find further information in the iTunes description of this episode and our website. Yeah, last time it was a, um, a, a public uh, lecture and they wanted me to talk on Gödel's Incompleteness Theorems. Yes, oh, I've seen this on YouTube. Yeah, I've seen it. On. It's good to do some. What are you talking about uh, this month? Um, mattering <laughs> <laughs> okay. well i'll come along with some really difficult questions <laughs> i'll base i'll turn up basically dressed as william lane craig and i'll just uh... <laughs> oh lord <laughs> yes well huh. thank you you've been listening to the beautiful soothing voices of mr ollie marley thank you for listening professor rebecca newberger goldstein thank you for listening and me jack symes thank you for listening Oh, that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> See, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> All right.